Good evening, everyone, and thank you all for joining us for another one of our Astronomy Off Tap Edinburgh events over the virtual Zoom and YouTube space. We've had uh, <clears throat> a lot of uh, technical difficulties uh, as uh, some technical gremlins got into our system today um, and wrecked some fun havoc. But we're here with you now. Um, I think you know my name is Shinran, and as many of you know, Astronomy on Tap is a free event run by volunteers, and uh, evidently so today. And under normal circumstances, we would take over a local pub and share and discuss science over a few or many pints. But since lockdown have started, we have moved our events uh, virtually online. So you will have to bring your own drinks, but you can still learn about some awesome science from the comfort of your own home. And if you have a moment, please subscribe to our YouTube channel and follow us on Twitter and Facebook. It would really help us a lot. And if you have any questions through our event, just pop it into YouTube chat or uh, message it to us via any of our social media channels, and we will ask the speakers at the end of their talks. If there is a topic you'd like to learn more about or indeed it is an expert on, we'd love to hear from you. Just message us via, again, uh, our social media uh, channels, and we'll endeavor to get back to you promptly. So. Without any further ado, let's get started. And we have an awesome lineup for you tonight. Firstly, it's over to our resident rocket man, Fred, who is going to give us an update on the exciting happenings in the world of rocket launches. Uh, over to you, Fred. Hello, good evening, everybody. Hope everyone's doing good. I'm going to share my screen. Um, let me know when you can see it, General, please. Yep, looking good. Right, cool. So. Um, yeah, I'm uh, broadcasting from a hotel room in Glasgow, where uh, I'm looking at the SECC and the, the old SECC, and it's pretty spectacular. But anyway, so um, February 2021, cool rocket launches. Uh, we've got quite a few exciting things happening, and there's a lot of Mars activity happening, which is uh, really exciting. I was intending on doing a talk on uh, successful landings on Mars, but there's actually quite a lot to talk about. So I'll just crack on with the rockets, because... This is what it's all about. Okay, so first up um, has already passed as two Falcon 9 missions to launch. Um, sorry about that. It's two Falcon 9 missions to launch uh, 60 satellites for the SpaceX Starlink broadband network with designated Starlink 18 and 17, respectively. They launched the other way around. Uh, but the cool thing about this is that uh, each satellite is equipped with the, the Hal, Hal FX Krypton powered ion thrusters, which is pretty neat. So they could reposition themselves in, in orbit. Uh, next up, so the first Mars um, entry is from the United Arab Emirates, their uh, Hope Orbiter mission, which, is, uh, which arrives on February the 9th. And this is to coincide with the 50th anniversary of the country's formation. Um, yeah, so there's some pretty cool geeky things on it, like a spectrometer examining interplanetary dust using star trackers, which is pretty neat. Uh, next up, the next day, China's Taiwan-1 orbiter arrives. Um, this, is, this is the first Chinese mission. So Taiwan-1 translates as have any questions. Um, so it'll include magnetometers, high-res cameras, and ground-penetrating radars. Uh, I'm not sure when they won't land. When they will land, sorry. Good luck to them. OK, so February 14th, you have Russia's Progress 77, which is an uncrewed resupply mission to the International Space Station. So it's due to arrive on the 17th. And this is being launched for the Soyuz 2A. Uh, as you can see, the GRAU index 14A14 serial number, which is pretty cool. Oh, also, this is the first one to use digital flight control systems. Next up on February 20th is Northrop Grumman's Cygnus NG15, which is a resupply also for the space station. Uh, February 18th. The one we've all been waiting for, the Mars Perseverance, will arrive. So it's expected to touch down on the same day, actually, at 8 o'clock BST. There are some links where you can actually go and watch this stuff live if you, if you guys are interested. Uh, then February 20th, the Cygnus NG-15, another resupply mission for the International Space Station. This will be the 14th flight. Uh, it's going to be launched on an Antares 230+. Plus. And then February 25th, you have Russia's OneWeb internet system. There'll be 36 uh, 
satellites of the constellation out of 648 to provide uh, high speed, low cost internet. Um, it's going to be launched on a Soyuz 21B. And that is the end of the rocket launches of this month. Awesome. So much activity. Love it. Cool. Thank you so much, Fred. Uh, now we are going to move to our first speaker of the evening, who is Dr. Rebecca Bowler, who completed her undergraduate degree in physics at the University of Cambridge. Um, that's when I think that's when we first met as we both attended a meeting of student physics societies organized by the Institute of Physics. And I remember the meeting in particular because the Cambridge University Physics Society spelt out cups, and she's told me about the tagline, you can't have a drink without cups. Uh, physics over drinks definitely aligns very well with the principles of astronomy on tap, so I feel like she is the perfect speaker for us. Um, she then went on to study distant galaxies as part of her PhD at the Institute of Astronomy here at the University of Edinburgh. Uh, and since 2015, she has been a research fellow at the University of Oxford, where she is an expert in the formation and evolution of rare, extremely luminous galaxies in the first 1.5 billion years. Uh, that very short time span. Uh, in March 2021, she will start a prestigious Ernst Rutherford Fellowship funded by UK Research and Innovation. And tonight, she will tell us about the birth of stars and galaxies so um, as always, as we say always, please sit back, uh, take a beverage of your choice uh, and join us to drink in the universe. Okay, over to you, uh, Rebecca. Thank you, that was a lovely introduction. Um, let me just share my screen. So I really wish I could be with you, uh, some of you in Edinburgh right now with a beer, but hopefully, hopefully soon. Um, so can you see my slides? Yes. Yes, looking good. Okay. All right, so in the next 10 minutes or so, I'm going to give you a very brief overview of some of the kind of key topics in my research. And this is focused on how to find the first galaxies, how we study them and what, what we think their properties are. Okay, so if we want to understand the first galaxies, we need to understand the first stars. And to understand the first stars, we need to understand what forms these stars. Um, and so this is a really lovely diagram which shows the Big Bang on the left and it and the following it the first few hours of the history of the universe. So in this very short time scale, the universe was basically a giant nuclear reactor. It first formed these um, kind of essential particles and then it smashed them together to form the atoms that we know and love today. Um, quite remarkably, this process is very well understood. It's quite a nice, neat physics experiment, if you can believe that. Uh, and what we know that is that after a few hours after the Big Bang, there was really only two or three atoms in existence, the very lightest atoms. This was hydrogen, helium and a very tiny amount of lithium. So this is the backdrop for the formation of the first stars and galaxies. OK. What happened after this is a process or sorry, a period called the Dark Ages. So this is a, a period we think it's around a few hundred million years where no stars had yet been born. And it, this is a really puzzling epoch, and it's one we really want to understand, you know, what was happening in these dark ages uh, prior to the formation of the first stars and galaxies. But what's interesting is that just a few hours after the Big Bang, we already had the ingredients for the first stars. So we had, as I said, this, these atoms, the hydrogen, helium, and a tiny bit of lithium. And we also had dark matter, which I'm not going to talk about in great detail, but we know it was there. So to, to push my ingredients cake analogy probably a bit too far, the reason why we don't have stars forming straight away after the Big Bang is that these atoms of this matter was too thinly spread, it was too diffuse, sort of like icing it on a cake, it was much too spread out to form the first stars and galaxies. And in fact, it, it took a bit of time and the addition of another ingredient, gravity, to be able to clump this matter together um, enough to form the first stars. So this is a, a really nice simulation. What you can see is structures forming um, in, the, in the cosmic web, we call it. So initially it was very smooth, like the icing on a cake, but through the action of gravity, we start to pull matter together. And it's at these bright pink points where the first stars and the first galaxies form once the matter is, is clumped close enough together. 
So thinking about when did the first star start shining from these really um, sophisticated simulations and theoretical arguments, it's thought that the first stars were born 200 million years after the Big Bang. Uh, and if that number doesn't mean much to you, I totally understand, but that was around 1% of the current age of the universe. So, so quite rapidly, but there was this period of the dark ages where, where we didn't have any stars at all. So once we have the first stars, we have the first galaxies, and to try and illustrate what these early galaxies were like, here I'm comparing uh, an early first galaxy on the right. This is an artist impression, by the way, I wish we had the data to, to show you this. I'll show you the real data for this object later on. Um, and on the left is a galaxy, our nearest neighbor Andromeda. So this is a galaxy now, today. So one of the biggest differences is, as I said, the, the ingredients, the chemical composition of these galaxies is completely different. In the early universe, the gas forming the stars was incredibly pristine. It was, it was only formed of these few, very few atoms. And this means the chemistry is completely different of the star formation. And if you think about say planet formation, this would have been, um, well, initially very difficult in the early universe. So this different chemical composition leads to a completely different type of galaxy, different population of stars. If we think about uh, our galaxy or the Andromeda galaxy, if you pick a random star, a typical star, it will be something like our sun. Our sun is a kind of bog standard star with a lifespan of around 10 billion years. If instead we, we were to go and stand next to one of these first galaxies, the stars would be completely different. The, the typical star, the normal star at this time was 300 times the mass of our sun. So absolute monster stars. And what this means is that they had incredibly short lives. So only a million years or um, a thousand times, sorry, 0.001 billion years uh, uh, age. So this means that they, they shine very, very brightly, very, very rapidly, and then they would um, explode. And finally, one of the kind of most striking differences between galaxies that we know and love today and galaxies in the first billion years was their extent, their size. So if I shrink that artist's impression down to the actual relative size um, of the Andromeda picture on the left, you can see a really dramatic difference here. So these, these galaxies were significantly smaller. In fact, they're more like the star clusters that populate the spiral arms of, of galaxies like the Milky Way. Uh, and it's you know through the, the remaining 14 billion years or so that we, we started to form these much more uh, substantial sources, galaxies. Okay, so I promised to show you what, this actual, what the actual data looks like for this galaxy. So on the right is the artist impression, and on the left is the Hubble Space Telescope image. So this is one of the best images we have of a first galaxy. And to me, this is fantastic. We can see different colored clumps in the, in the galaxy. Um, it's not just one blob, which is typically what I'm working, working with. Um, but I can understand if this was some, somewhat underwhelming. I mean, you have to remember this is a galaxy uh, that's many um, telling us about the early universe. So the data, data processing is very challenging. So how is it that I'm able to show you this image of a galaxy that's from you know, one of the first galaxies from the first billion years of the universe. Well, this is down to fantastic trick of astronomy. We're able to look back in time through, through the universe due to the finite speed of light. So uh, if you were to look at the sun, which I'm definitely not recommending, then what you would actually be seeing is light that left the sun around eight minutes before. And this is because even within our own solar system, the, the scales are so vast in astronomy, that it takes even light eight minutes to get to us. So we can use the exact same principle to go further and further out in the universe. I, you know, our nearest star is maybe five light years away. So we're seeing it as it was in the past five, five years ago, all the way back to the most extreme sources like this galaxy here, where the light has taken 13 billion years to get to us. So we're seeing it as it was uh, in the first, you know, first epochs of, of, of galaxies. So what happens to the light from this galaxy as it travels on its immense journey to our telescopes, like the Hubble Space Telescope on the right here? 
Well, a couple of things happen. The first is it gets extremely dim. So if you imagine a candle, the light from a candle is spreading out in all directions. The same thing's happening for the light from the galaxy. So the, the light that we capture from these sources is so incredibly diffuse by the time it reaches our telescopes. And so these sources, particularly the most distant ones, are very challenging to observe. The second thing that happens is it gets extremely red. So due to the expansion of the universe, the light on its journey is, is stretched. And this means that the, through a process called cosmological redshift, and this means that the lights from these very um, energetic stars in the first galaxies, this is, if you were standing next to it, it would be in the ultraviolet, you get a really, really terrible sunburn. But because we're now observing it after its very long journey to our telescopes, it's been stretched all the way into the infrared um, regime of light. So in fact, to find the most distant galaxies, you need an infrared telescope, uh, not, a, not a UV telescope or an optical telescope. So I'm gonna end in my last few minutes here talking a little bit about the future of this field of observing these very distant galaxies of, of which I've shown you one really interesting example. So the Hubble Space Telescope's been the real pioneer of this field. And on the left here, you can see the Hubble Space Telescope and the kind of diagram of its mirror here. And it's now coming up to being 31 years old and it's discovered the most distant galaxies we know to date. And this is because it can go, it's, well, it's a large telescope, it's in space, so it's very sensitive and it can go quite red as well. So we can find these very red galaxies. Um, the James Webb Space Telescope, which is due for launch this year, so hopefully it will be in your rockets update um, in October, is, you know, it's, it's the, the successor to Hubble. And the reason why it's better is, firstly, you can see from this diagram, it's bigger. That means it can collect more light from these very dim galaxies. And secondly, it's an infrared telescope. So it's specifically designed to look in the red um, part, of the, part of the wavelength range. And that means that it can find even more distant galaxies than uh, Hubble can. So that's really, really exciting for studying these first galaxies. So it really exists. Here it is, is a photo a few years old now, but I just really love it because of the amazing scale. You can see the, the people here in comparison to the mirror, it's absolutely enormous. And this is it in uh, Houston being loaded into the vacuum chamber to do tests. Um, and I'm just gonna end here with this video of James Webb opening up on its journey through um, through space to its final orbit. Um, and just, yeah, just to reiterate that it's really gonna be a step change because of these two capacities I said, the fact that it's much larger and the fact that it's going into the infrared. And um, it's thought that it's going to be able to detect some of the first galaxies, um, but it also has the potential to detect some of the first stars individually. Now it can't, it's not sensitive enough to detect them, you know, to, to measure the light from a single star, but what it could do is measure the light from a supernova explosion from one of these stars. So I think that's a really um, amazing possibility with this, with this telescope. Uh, I think I'm about out of time, so I'll stop there. Thank you. Amazing, thank you so much. Uh, for that fascinating talk. And actually, I was just looking and collating the questions. Our viewers wanted to say how great they found your explanation of the ideas. Um, and we have some questions from our viewers. Um, so firstly, I think Andrew asked um, at the start of your talk, is it possible that the Big Bang was caused by a black hole forming in another universe? Tough question. <laughs> That's a very tough question. Wow. Um, yeah, I have no idea. That sounds like a very interesting hypothesis. I mean, I definitely deal with the... Um... Sorry, I'm just trying to find my Zoom here. I, I, uh, I definitely deal with the, the galaxies that have formed after the Big Bang, so I'm not an expert on that, and I'm going to pass. <laughs> uh, okay, perfect. The next question is um, from Roger, and the question is, what was the size of the universe? So I think you showed uh, the, 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 the first galaxy that was formed some 13 billion years ago, but he was asking, I think you showed the size of that compared to our galaxy, but he's wondering, you know, what's the size of the universe at this time uh, in terms of how many light years would it be across? Yeah, again, I don't know. Um, 
I've absolutely no idea. I mean, yeah. Yeah, these are these are hard questions. Hard no, questions. I mean, no cosmology questions. I'm not a cosmologist. <laughs> <laughs> yes. I uh, like galaxies. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I work in dark matter physics, and and any astronomy questions really baffle me too. Yeah. <laughs> um, so we had a question from uh, Andrew. Uh, again, and he said, I just read an article where radio astronomers claim to have located stars 190 million years after the Big Bang. And he was wondering, what, what are your thoughts on that uh, claim? Uh, yes, though, no, that's really interesting. Um, yeah, this is a completely different measurement. So um, whereas the research I do is to measure directly the light from, from these stars, that measurement was kind of inferring the existence of stars from a, a global signature from the radio over the whole over the whole night sky. And so that's like a really interesting independent measurement. Um, it's very difficult to do. And I think that measurement was kind of a bit before its time. So I, there's a lot of discussion about whether it's really real or not, but measurements like that are definitely the future of the mm -hmm. field completely, yeah. Ooh. So we, we await to see if it's uh, true. Yes. Uh, and last question, um, I think, question is how many generations uh, or regenerations of stars have we ha have we gone through since the first stars were born? Yeah, that's a great question. So in typical astronomy style, everything has a really confusing name, but we call these the first generation of stars, the population three stars. Um, <laughs> and we're now, we're now on population one. So there's thought to be around kind of three reprocessing cycles that come down to, to the stars we know locally. Yeah, if you Google population three stars, that's the first generation. <laughs> <laughs> Should I ask how that name came about? I, I don't know, but um, yeah, I'm not happy with the person who came up with it. <laughs> Love it. Well, perfect. Thank you so much for that talk and for joining us this evening. Uh, I think next uh, we move over to our resident games master, John, uh, and I look forward to finding out uh, what game we'll be playing with this month. Thanks very much, Jinran, uh, and welcome everybody uh, to, to, to Astronomy on Tap, or uh, well, Astronomy off Tap, uh, as we are at the minute. So uh, just for this month's game, uh, we're going to ask everybody watching uh, if they can participate. It's going to take a little bit of thinking um, and a little bit of figuring out, so, so if everybody can get their thinking caps on. So I'm just going to share my screen just now, and hopefully everybody can see me okay. Jinran, is that coming up all right? Uh, yes, looking good. Great. Okay, so uh, this is a rehash of a game that we've, we've played in the past uh, and everybody commented how it was a little bit challenging. So we decided because, of course, the Astronomy Off Tap Edinburgh crowd is an intelligent bunch that we're going to do it again. So basically your job is, and I'll leave this up um, for a little period of time. We'll also put it out on, on Twitter and on Facebook as well so everybody can see it. So uh, there are six anagrams that have been created here. Each of those is a term related to astronomy. So some of them are one word, some of them are two words, but your job is to unscramble these six different terms. Once you've unscrambled them, some are easier than others, some are more difficult than others, so you might have to work it out. Once you've unscrambled each of those six, you then need to rearrange using only the first letter of the unscrambled word. So you rearrange the letter it's using the first letter and then you can spell out a term again related to astronomy. So that's what's in our boxes here. So it's a six letter word. There are six different astronomical phrases. Once you've unscrambled them, take the first letter of the unscrambled word and then place it in the boxes. And if once you've got those arranged, you should be able to spell out an astronomical term. Now I can't figure out if this is more difficult than last time slightly easier than last time if everybody's brains are frazzled from like you know a year of zoom calls sitting working at home during the pandemic but hopefully hopefully our audience is smart enough to be able to figure this one out so i'll what i'll do is i'll leave this up just for a short time just so everybody can kind of have a look uh, if you're at home and you're technologically minded you can screenshot it and use it elsewhere but as i said what we'll do is we'll, we'll pop it up on youtube and um, on uh, twitter and facebook so everybody can can have a look through it and at the end, after our, our final game, right at the end of our event today, uh, I will reveal the answers. 
if you do figure out the answer and you think you've got it, then please pop it up on Twitter, stick it on the comments on YouTube, put it on Facebook, send it by carrier pigeon, throw it in by semaphore, whatever, whichever communication method you prefer, uh, send it in. But do let us know. Uh, and I will now hand back to our, our gregarious host, uh, Mr. Jinran Lu, and I will stop sharing my screen. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, I'm so bad at those games. Uh, I, can, I, I think somebody in our audience got it super quick last time, right? I think they got it like within a minute or something of you setting it. I think last time it was pretty quick. Someone got it quickly, but this time I'm hoping it's of a difficulty level where we can stretch it out over the event. Oh, so it's harder than last time? Oh, dear. Uh, well, we, sh we shall see anyway. <laughs> okay, well, thank you very much. Um, okay, so whilst you work on that, uh, we will move uh, to our next speaker of the evening, um, who is Dr. Stephanie Yardley, who is, uh, who is a postdoctoral research fellow in space weather based at University College London's Mollard Space Science Laboratory. Uh, her research focuses on the evolution of the sun's magnetic field in the buildup to solar eruptions, which can lead to spectacular displays of the aurora, but can also cause severe disruptions to our technological systems on Earth. And here in Edinburgh, we just recently experienced a citywide power cut for 40 minutes, which was very exciting on a, uh, on a Sunday evening. Um, so, so, you know, so Earth-wide events like that could be somewhat uh, terrifying. Uh, alongside her research, she is actively involved in public engagement and outreach activities, which include giving talks, demonstrations, and space-related activities. And of course, joining us here tonight, uh, she is also a guest lecturer and resident astronomer for various cruise lines traveling around the world. And I'm always very jealous of uh, her adventures. So. Um, but tonight she is with us uh, to tell us about our own explosive sun, which is a super exciting topic. Uh, over to you, Stephanie. Okay, hopefully everyone can see my screen. Yes, so please. tonight I'm going to talk about our explosive sun and I'm going to make it obvious as to why we call it explosive. And so the reason we do call it this is because of the sun's magnetic field. So the sun has an extremely strong magnetic field and we get activity that relates to the magnetic field and build up of energy in these fields. So I'm gonna talk a bit about these eruptions and how they affect us here on earth. So here is an image of our visible sun. And as Rebecca said, um, the sun is normally considered as a bog standard star. However, as you can see in this image, you can see that there are uh, what we call sunspots on the surface. And these are the regions or dark patches that you see. And this is where there are concentrations of really strong magnetic fields. And so when the sun is particularly active and there's loads of sunspots on the surface, we generally get eruptions associated with these regions. And this is what it looks like, the magnetic footprint of these sunspots. And I'm just gonna go through the different layers of the sun. So now we go back to the visible surface and then we're gonna go up through different wavelengths of light. So you're looking at ultraviolet light and we're looking at tens of thousands of degrees gas. And then as we keep going, we see the outer atmosphere of the sun. Um, you can see different features visible here. So you can see some loops. And this is what you're looking at is 1 million or even hotter than that uh, degree plasma. So you can see the sun looks different depending upon what wavelength of light that we're looking at. So now I'd just like to show you what the sun looks like today. Luckily, we've got loads of satellites that monitor our sun. And so I actually took this image uh, just before the talk this evening. And unfortunately, the sun doesn't look very interesting right now. But what you might see is we've got one of these small sunspot regions um, very close to the edge of the sun here. It's very small, it's just emerging onto the sun. We have this um, structure next to it, which we call um, a filament. And this is essentially hot gas, which is suspended in the atmosphere. And then next to it, we have what is known as a coronal hole. And this is event, uh, essentially where the sun's wind can actually escape. And this can also cause aurora as well as the eruptions. So I'd just like to start off with what our sun looks today and hopefully in the future it will start to look more interesting as the sun cycle starts to ramp up. 
So these sunspots are associated with magnetic fields. These are magnetic fields within the sun that actually uh, rise through the surface and break through. And you can see that there's actually, we don't actually look at the magnetic fields themselves. You can see the hot gas or plasma that is trapped um, along these field lines. So it's a bit like um, looking at uh, iron filings with a magnet. And so you can think of the sun as having these magnets um, with the plasma trapped along where we trace the magnetic field lines. And so here's just a zoom in of these sunspots on the surface. So I just want to give you an idea of the size of these sunspots. Obviously the sun is absolutely huge, but as you zoom in, you can see the detail on the surface surrounding the sunspots. So you can see the cells of hot gas and plasma, but you also see these dark regions of sunspots and they're actually around the size of the Earth or sometimes we get them on the order of the size of Jupiter. So these really are humongous monsters on our sun's surface. Now the sun goes through uh, various, well, it goes through a solar cycle. This solar cycle is roughly 11 years in length. And this just tells us how active the sun is. It's all to do with the magnetic field uh, associated with the sun and how they uh, wind up and break through the surface. So what you'll see here is the sun at different parts of one solar cycle uh, from uh, 1996 onwards. And you'll see that the images at the back, the sun doesn't really have many bright features these loops that are associated with these sunspot regions. But as you come towards the front in 2001, you can see the sun has many bright uh, loops and these uh, structures on the sun. And this is when we get generally a lots of activity. So this is what we call solar maximum. And when we have low activity, this is called solar minimum. So we've been looking at these sunspots for, well, maybe even thousands of years, but the earliest records or continuous records of sunspot observations started around 400 years ago with the invention of the telescope in the 1600s. And now what you can see here is the solar cycle at work. So you see the number of sunspots that we see on the surface uh, as a function of time. And you can see that there's this 11 year cycle that continues um, throughout history. So now we are currently on solar cycle 25. So we label each solar cycle. And what we like to do is try and predict how active the sun is going to be and how many sunspots there are on the surface. So one of the reasons why we don't see much on the surface or in the atmosphere of the sun at the moment is because we are currently at solar minimum. So we passed through solar minimum, the end of the previous cycle and we're going into solar cycle 25 now sometime um, last year and so hopefully over the next couple of years we start to see more sunspots on the surface and the more sunspots we, we get the more activity we get associated with these spots. So I won't go into all the different types of eruptive activity we can get with these sunspots. However, the ones that I'm most interested in are these coronal mass ejections, they're called. And these are essentially eruptions of this hot gas or plasma and magnetic fields from the surface of the sun. So what you can see here is we have, uh, it's almost like an artificial eclipse blocking the light of the sun. And you can see these huge eruptions traveling at several million miles an hour out into space. And these can actually be earth directed and uh, hit us here and affect us here on earth. And now I'm just going to show this uh, lovely movie taken by one of the taken by the stereo satellite and it shows you the small sun in the center and you can see these eruptions traveling all the way out through space and here you can see us uh, the little dot here is earth and you can see these eruptions traveling towards us and affecting us here on the earth. Now, luckily for us, we actually have our own shield that protects us from the sun's radiation, otherwise we wouldn't be here. Um, and this often, when one of these eruptions arrive, it often interacts with the Earth's shield, so the, own, the Earth's own magnetic field called the magnetosphere. And this often means that energetic particles from the sun actually get accelerated towards the poles of the Earth. And this can create things such as the aurora. So it's the interaction between the energetic particles from the sun and the particles in the Earth's atmosphere that actually create the aurora uh, borealis or aurora australis, depending upon whether you're in the northern or southern hemisphere. 
So here are some just uh, really nice movies and images of the Aurora. You can see the top one is from the, as viewed from the International Space Station, which is particularly a nice movie. But not only do we get the beautiful aurora, we also get lots of technical issues here on Earth. So along with these eruptions and other eruptive phenomena from the sun, this can create so many different problems for us out in space and upon Earth. So for example, if we've got astronauts um, up in space, they can obviously receive a, a really bad, a really high dose of radiation. This could potentially be life threatening for them. You have satellites out in space. Um, so not only are we using that, for example, to image the sun, but things, it can affect communication, things like uh, radio communication or GPS. Um, it affects airlines, crew and passengers, not just the radiation, but also the communications and things such as the uh, power grid as well. So we can get power outages um, as it affects, it, it causes ground induced currents and affects the power systems. So essentially what our job is, is to try and predict when these eruptions are going to occur by looking at these sunspot regions. And essentially what we're trying to predict, we're almost like weather forecasters, but for space. So this is what a lot of me and my colleagues um, work on at the moment. Now, to do this, we have a whole fleet of spacecraft up into space, some of them that are looking at the sun themselves and others that are also monitoring what's going on in the um, Earth's magnetis magnetosphere and also the Earth's atmosphere. And in particular, I just wanted to highlight one of the most recent missions, which is the Solar Orbiter mission, and that was actually uh, launched this time last year, so to a year ago today. And this mission is going to see the sun up close. So it's going to be one of the closest missions um, moving towards the sun. And it's going to eventually reach a distance within the orbit of Mercury. So it's going to get really close in. It's going to look at all this activity that goes on on the surface. And it's going to take a look at the magnetic fields. And in fact, it's going to get the first images of the poles of the sun. So we're really excited about this mission. And Again, I just want to show this really nice image that was taken uh, from Cocoa Beach. So I actually, I was lucky enough to go last year and I went to uh, the Kennedy Space Center and watched the launch, the very successful launch of Solar Orbiter. And so now we're just getting for back the first data from this mission. So yeah, I'll leave you with that and thank you very much. Amazing, thank you so much. Uh, that picture is spectacular. Yeah, it's so one of my favorites. So you took that yourself? It's absolutely <laughs> No, I didn't. <laughs> um, I think someone posted it on Twitter. I did I did get a video of the launch, um, which is uh, pretty, pretty amazing, and didn't really take any pictures. I was just basically taking it all in. It was the first launch I've seen, and hopefully not the last. Yeah. I think, I think being there and taking it in is probably uh more important for sure it's uh, so, so quickly it, uh, you know it's gone within five minutes yeah <laughs> yeah and i'm sure there are as you say uh, there are expert professionals out there taking the photos so you can always uh, look back on them later um yeah. so uh and i also didn't i think we don't always fully appreciate just how incredible uh, and complex our own sun uh, our own star is so that's really amazing um, I had a quick question before we start, though. Have you ever observed the aurora on your many trips? Um, yes, I have. So I've been really lucky. And I think on three separate occasions, two or three separate occasions, I've seen the aurora. And one of them was happened to be mainly on cruise ships when I'm giving my talks. And one happened to be um, during one of the most active periods. It was oh, in man. 2015 and they called it the St. Patrick's Day storms. <laughs> Uh, March 2015 so I was on for the solar eclipse so although we didn't see the solar eclipse because it was northern Europe and it's cloudy we saw one of the probably the best aurora in 11 years so <laughs> right place right top <laughs> yeah oh, wow I think that's one of the definitely one of the things I want to see at some point in my lifetime I would definitely recommend it, um, for, it, it honestly it is I was yeah speechless it was amazing amazing uh so we have lots of questions from our viewers. Um, I think to start, uh, the first question we got was, how likely is something like the Carrington event happening, going to happen again? Yeah, so um, I think the Carrington event is probably a once every 100 year event. We still get 
severe events that occur and it depends upon what type of event you're uh, looking at, whether you're looking at these eruptions or you can get energetic particles as well. But um, generally, yes, yeah, so probably every 100 years, but we'll get smaller events that could happen sooner, maybe like once every 10 years or so. And these would obviously still affect us here on Earth. And in fact, there was one, I think that happened in 2012 uh, during the Olympics. So there was all these Daily Mail articles, for example, going, oh, you know, we might, might not be able to watch the Olympics. But luckily, the a huge eruption that came was, wasn't was towards us. So we were lucky. But I mean, there was times, for example, in 1989, when the whole of Quebec lost power for nine hours due to one of these eruptions. So they, they do occur. It's just a matter of when. Yeah. Um... So Roger asked the question, which is, can you tell, uh, can you tell him whether white stars have any kind of activity on them after they run out of fusion, detonate and become dwarf stars? Wow, that's really interesting. I'm going to say not as much because a lot of the activity depends upon the magnetic field and the strength of the magnetic field. So in fact, our sun is I, I'm going to say it again, even though it's my favorite star, it is a bog standard star. And so you do get more massive stars with huge magnetic fields. And there's a lot of work that people are doing looking at um, these eruptions and, and eruptive events on different stars, which are a lot bigger and would be a lot more catastrophic than ours. But it's a lot dif more difficult to do because obviously with our sun, we're really lucky. It's our closest star. We could, we've got all these satellites that can take images um, of the sun, whereas you can't do that with other stars. So I'm not entirely sure, um, but I'm going to say maybe less active. It depends upon the star itself and what stage of its evolution. Yeah. Um, so so that's kind of related. There was another related question, which is, can coronal mass ejection happen on other stars? Yes, so they do. And they are, so you can have, there's a lot of talk of like super, they call them super flares or, or super eruptions that occur on other stars. And yeah, there's a lot of work going into trying to um, observe them. And a lot of the ways that they kind of look at activity, from what I understand is, I'm not sure about the eruptions, but they look for the sunspots. So if you've got huge, so these stars will have huge magnetic fields, really strong, and they'll have these huge spots. And so they will actually, this will affect the light curves, I think, of the stars. Don't quote me on this because it's not my area, but you can kind of tell whether there's these huge spots on the surface from their spectra. And so that's really interesting. Cool. And the last question is kind of a combo of two, which is how far in advance can you predict a solar flare and with what kind of level of accuracy? And how do you detect and plan ahead for soon to be NASA moon missions, uh, you know, to prevent harm to astronauts and such? So um, essentially these, so these eruptions, the fastest is probably about a day. So the counting event was 17.5 hours it took to reach Earth. Generally, typically they're more like three to five days. And a lot of the time we try and predict them is we see the eruption occur. So we use the satellite, see the eruption occur in the, the imagery that I showed where you, create an artificial eclipse and then you can kind of model um, its eruption and whether it's going to reach earth or not then you don't even know whether it will be effective or not because it depends a lot upon the orientations of the magnetic field so that's what we're trying that's what we do what we're trying to do is try to get five days warning so that we can um, and that's my job I look at the source regions so look at the evolution of the sunspots to try and get more warnings so we can say for example, to the national grid, that they need to spread out their power, try and protect their systems because they, they actually need five days and we can't give them five days. So it, yeah, we're, we often say we're about 40, 40 years behind weather prediction and you know how weather can be off. <laughs> <laughs> right. So do, do you get a cool, like someone to call if the, you realize a huge solar eruption was happening? Do you get on the phone with somebody and go, you know, be prepared. Be prepared. Well, I guess um, there's, uh, for us in the UK, there's the Met Office, right? So the Met Office have their own space weather prediction center. So they will issue alerts saying that there's either, say, an eruption or a particle event. Um, and so they will, they will tell various people, whether it's the aviation industry or, you know, um, the national grid. 
Um, so there's various end users of these products. And there's the same in America, they have the, the NOAA Space Weather Prediction Center in Colorado. So they will issue alerts normally on the web. So they're monitoring the sun 24 seven, looking for these eruptions and various things on the sun. And then we're hopefully, hopefully trying to inform them what to look out for. Amazing. Uh, cool. Uh, well, thank you so much for answering all those questions. Uh, I think we are now moving to our uh, final game of the evening, uh, which will pit our speakers against each other in a friendly way, of course. And for this, I hand, uh, hand power back over to our resident games master, John. Um, over to you. Thank you, Jinran. Thank you very much. Um, and thank you to, to Stephanie and Rebecca for the two fantastic uh, talks. It's been really, really interesting and we really appreciate you uh, giving up your time to come and join us. Um, and to thank you, we're going to get you involved in a game, uh, which is the way we always thank our, our speakers. We, we get them involved uh, and we, we sort of get some involved in activities. So what I'm going to do is if I can ask uh, Stephanie and Rebecca to, to unmute and to turn your videos on. I think we should say, we, we should tell the audience we never uh, tell our speakers in advance. We always ambush them. Uh, <laughs> just just before the the call starts we do it, it's it's a it's a thing that we do each time uh, and 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 people keep coming back so it can't be too bad um i will just say before we start the game uh we haven't had anybody guess uh our first uh sort of our first game that we've done it is on twitter and facebook so if you do want to go and have a look nobody's come through with the answer just yet so i'll, I'll save off telling everybody the answer give everybody <sighs> a bit more time okay so I'm just going to share my screen just now. Okay. Okay. So hopefully everybody can see my screen. Stephanie and Rebecca, can you see that? Yeah, yeah all good. Lovely. Okay. So uh, this is the third edition uh, of this. Is a, this is a AOT Edinburgh um, copyrighted game, uh, which is our our game of Star or Starlet. So. As, as people involved in, in astronomy, uh, I'm going to give you the name of either uh, a beautiful star residing in our universe, you know, in the mysteries of the galaxy of the cosmos, or the name of a celebrity's child. And it is your job to figure <laughs> out which of these is this. Now, obviously, you've got a bit of a leg up being involved in, in, in sort of astronomy in general. So you might have a bit more of a, a, a sort of a, a chance than some of our contestants. Um, but basically, I'm going to give you a name. It's your job to tell me, is it a star or is it a bouncing bundle of joy starlet? So uh, I'm going to go with, if Rebecca, if I can go with you first, if that's all right, because you were our first speaker tonight. There are five questions each. So we're going to see how, how both of you come out at the end of the, the, uh, the game. So we'll start with question one. So uh, this is volume three, by the way. This is the third time we've played this game. It's enormously popular. We're going to get it syndicated. Okay. So, wait, but volume three in astronomy means the first time. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> See, we're full of these hidden messages. <laughs> okay, so Rebecca, are you ready? Yeah. All right, so our first one, Ime. Is it a star or is it a starlet? Starlet. Starlet. It is... A star. It is actually in the southern constellation of Crux, and it is actually in the Southern Cross. It's the faintest star in the Southern Cross. It probably has a, another name as well. So unfortunately, okay, the first one is down. Okay, Stephanie, are you ready? I'm not sure. <laughs> <laughs> There's no judgment here because I'm probably pronouncing these wrong as well, so don't worry. Okay, so question number two in Star or Starlet. Radix. Star or Starlet? I'm going to go with star. Star. It is, in fact, a starlet. That is Cameron <laughs> Diaz's son. Oh, no. Not Cameron Diaz's son in the picture because uh, there aren't any on, on, on Google. I tried for a long time. Um, but, yeah, so it is Cameron Diaz's son. It's called Radix. So, so, so far, zero, zero. It's okay. <laughs> All to play for. Okay, so back to you, Rebecca. Number three. Lily Berea, star or starlet? 
Oh, this is just going to be, I'm going to get, yeah, this is just random guessing. Starlet. Starlet. It is a star. Right. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so it's actually in, in the Aries constellation, and it's also called uh, 39 uh, Ariatus, which I can pronounce wrong. Uh, okay, so question four, back to Stephanie. All to play for. Leo or Lyo or Lou, I'm not sure. I, I feel like I'm not, I can't even call these educated guesses. Starlet, go on, Starlet. Starlet, let's see. You're correct! Yay! Steven Gerrard's <laughs> son is a very cute Stevie G's uh, son called Lyo, Leo, I'm not sure. It might be Leo, I'm not too sure. Okay, so you've taken the lead. Yes, Definitely yes. one nil on the lead. Okay. Okay, so Rebecca, you can catch up, don't worry. Next one is Serafina. Oh, God. I don't know. <laughs> it's late at night, and I didn't, you guys didn't know you were going to play this game, so I've, don't worry. <laughs> I've done astronomy from like nine until 9 p.m. today, so my friend is completely... <laughs> don't worry. There's no um, pressure. I don't know. I don't know. Star. Star. It's going to be a baby, isn't it? It yeah. is a baby, yes. It's Ben <laughs> Affleck and Jennifer Garner's daughter. Her name is Serafina. So unfortunately, you didn't get the point. Okay, back to you, Stephanie. We're almost there, guys. Don't worry. Okay, so Peacock, star or starlet? I feel like this might be a trick. Hmm. <laughs> I'm going to chance it and go star. You are correct. It is a star. It is a blue-white star. It's the brightest in the Parvo constellation. Okay, apologies, Rebecca. You're losing 2-0, but you can come back. It's all to play for. Okay, next question. Sheliak or Sheliak? Do I get a prize if I get them all wrong as well? <laughs> yes. we, we have a lot of ESA posters. We will send you one in the post, I promise. Okay. Okay. Um, I don't know. I don't know. Star. You are correct. Well done. It is a star. It is a, a binary. It's an eclipsing binary star system. Uh, I wrote down very badly on my notes. Okay, so 2-1. It's getting very, very tense. Stephanie. <laughs> Phineas. Uh. <laughs> yes. I'm going to go with star again. Star. It is oh. a starlet. Oh, so very close. So that is Julia Roberts. I want to say son. I can't remember. But it's, it's one of those three <laughs> children in the big pack. So anyway, yeah, Phineas. Okay, so wow, this is getting, it's still 2-1. It's getting very exciting. Okay, Rebecca. Your next one is Zavi Jabba. Star. Correct. Very good. We brought it back to 2-2. Two, two. This is very exciting. Yeah, so that's in the Virgo constellation. It's also called Beta uh, Virginis or Virginis. Um, okay, so we have one question left. Uh -oh. One question left, Stephanie. So tense. So tense. X A A 12. <laughs> Star or Starlet? Starlet. It is, of course, Starlet. That is Elon Musk's lovely bundle of joy that he called, for some reason, this. So, Stephanie, today you are our winner. Congratulations. Well done. But, Rebecca, thank you so much for playing. Thank you, both of you, for playing. You're really, really good sports. I really appreciate you playing. So, well done. You are the winner. And I will hand back to our, our host, Jean. Is it time to announce the result of your earlier game, John? Well, I just want to see, did anybody, has anybody guessed, has anybody guessed the, the game? I'll, I'll put it up one more time. I think uh, it's just, a hard one. I, I, I personally have only gotten one, I think. I'm not sure. Maybe not. It is a challenging one. i tell you what, what we could do is I could, uh, I could put, give, give everybody a bit more time and maybe we'll put the answers up, but, or should we share it now? What do you think? Um... Well, we could put it. We could we could uh, share it right at the end. Um, okay, I guess and, I'll give everybody uh, a little bit more time, and then I'll, I'll let you say the, the last word. And then I'll share. Yeah, it right exactly, here. exactly. The last okay. minute. This is like <laughs> countdown. You should get the clock music on. Um, but right. yes, so, well, 
Uh, actually, all there is left for me to do is, uh, on behalf of Astronomy on Tap team here at Edinburgh, uh, I would like to thank our uh, both our amazing speakers again and our audience for tuning in and for staying with us as we uh, uh, dealt with our technical gremlins. And uh, and that's uh, and that's all there's left for me to say, uh, other than have a fantastic rest of February, and we will see you all in March. Uh, and now, John will reveal the results. Okay, a little bit of a drum roll. <laughs> or whatever the end of countdown music is. Okay, so the answer was, and I can show everybody on my screen. Oh. So the word was Apollo. So we had Pulsar. Asteroid, Oort cloud, light year, lunar eclipse, orbit. If you spell those words out, you had Apollo. So if you didn't get it, don't worry. It was a really hard one, and we only gave you like 30 minutes to figure it out. Um, but if you did get it, well done. You should you, you enjoy Mensa. It's perfect. But that was our quiz for tonight. We'll have another one in the future, and we'll try and make it a bit easier next time. So thank you, everybody, for playing. <laughs> that, that was a secret test to Mensa, of course. So, bye. Thank you for playing, everybody. Take care. Bye.